This is. Et voilà. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Sapphic Writers Invade the Written Word. Uh, I am L. Iyer, and I write science fiction and paranormal romance. And we're going to let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, Riley. Hello, I'm Riley Scott. I write contemporary uh, women loving women romance, as well as uh, my latest title is a young adult novel. So. And MB Austin. Hey, I'm MB Austin. I write thrillers and mystery and steampunk, not all of them at the same time. Um, the, mis the thriller series is the Maji Rio series, starts with Strictly Need to Know, goes on to Running Off Radar, finishes up sort of with Double Down. Um, and my current work in progress is a uh, mystery. Look at you all prepared. I wish I had thought to have my books in mm -hmm. front of me. Mari Ness. Hi, I'm Mari Ness. I'm uh, primarily a short fiction writer and a poet. Um, so I'm also slightly prepared. Uh, this is <laughs> the queerest of the books, a uh, little uh, short chat book, um, which I'm bringing up also because uh, this is put out by Neon Hemlock. Uh, and Neon Hemlock Press has a number of extremely queer, sapphic, gay, all kinds of like, let's go as rainbow and as powerfully queer and gay and marvelous as we can. Uh, so even if you don't check this out, check out Neon Hemlock. And uh, my other publishers would like you to remember that I have these two. <laughs> so let me get this correct. <laughs> but these are from, uh, let us say, less um, theme-oriented presses. Neon Hemlock, let's hear from, <laughs> let's hear from Neon Hemlock. Uh, and uh, with that. Cool. You can see we're all a little bit out of it. Three of us just got back from the Golden Crown Literary Society conference last weekend in Albuquerque. Um, so moving on, I do want to say that Meredith Dench, unfortunately, will not be able to join us today due to connectivity issues. Uh, she sends her uh, sincere apologies for that. So question one. No. one Al, Al, who are you and what do you write? Who am I? I said what I am, who I am and what I write. I'm L. Iron. Oh, I write on. paranormal and science fiction. And my upcoming title is Harsh Reality, which is a uh, demon possession, time traveler, old west romance. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's me. I'm everything. <laughs> so what brought each of you to writing sapphic fiction? For me, it was, it was a situation where I was writing straight romance and uh, straight science fiction romance and I wasn't selling anything. And I started to recognize that maybe there was something missing because I am a bisexual author and maybe my true heart wasn't behind the words. And so I decided to try writing uh, sapphic romance into my sci-fi. And the very first one I wrote actually sold. So there, there is something to be said for writing what you really deeply feel. Uh, what about the rest of you? Let's start with MB. What brought you to this? Um, the first novel I wrote was the first Maji and it actually started as a screenplay. Um, at the time I had seen, well, you know, film. Mostly you will not, you will see independently produced films if two women are in love somewhere in the movie. Um, but you don't see until very recently any leading women characters uh, who are carrying the film and also um, have relationships with women that are not like friendships. I mean, most movies have trouble passing the Bechdel test to begin with. So putting in main characters who are strong female leads and then also um, have relationships with other women that are significant was really unusual. And I thought, I have this idea. I'm going to write the movie I want to see. So I wrote the first um, Maji story. And then I got so invested in the characters and their world and all of that, that I turned it into a novel um, and kept going from there. I would love to see that made into a film. That would be <laughs> such an awesome movie. I would be happy to option it to any um, <laughs> major motion picture. Anyone's group. listening. Um, <laughs> Mari, what brought you to this? Uh, so um, 
uh, like Elle, I am a uh, bisexual uh, person. Um, I would say that the majority of my work is, I, I said this uh, to a couple of people this week, but majority of my work is queer, not necessarily sapphic, but queer. And what happens to me is that I'll be writing and suddenly two sapphic characters jump in and there we are. <laughs> so I don't actually deliberately set out to write sapphic um, art at all. Uh, I would say, which is probably why only about five, 10 percent of my work can be strictly qualified as sapphic, even though I would say 90 to 95 percent is certainly queer. Uh, but, you know, when your characters are falling in love with a woman for whatever reason, uh, and they happen to be women, then that's how I follow it. Uh, so it's not something I deliberately do. It's something that just pops up, uh, somewhat like my horror writing, not something I deliberately do, but then this story turns out to be horror. Um, and I will say that prior to doing all this science fiction fantasy, I did write quite a bit of erotica. And in those cases, you know, I followed what I was doing. I'm bisexual. <laughs> so that kind of, uh, you know, uh, went into that sort of writing, so had some experience with it. I really want to know what surprise horror is, but that sounds like a completely different panel. A different panel. <laughs> yeah, I'll totally ask you about that at some point in the distant future. Riley, how did you get here? Well, I grew up in a really small town, like 700 people small. Um, and so as a queer youth, even in the like 90s and 2000s, um, we've come a long way since then. But during that time, you know, it wasn't necessarily a time where I could find any type of representation. Um, and so I would cling to anything, the few books that I could find in our local bookstore, um, any slight, no matter how problematic, uh, gay reference in a TV show. Um, I, I watched the... <clears throat> the OC that, that those like three episodes where there was some queer content on repeat. Um, so I was desperate for anything where I felt seen um, and, and like I wasn't alone. And so I actually, my first uh, sapphic novel, I wrote very shortly after I graduated college. Um, and it was when I was still kind of grappling with, you know, coming out and, and, and everything like that. So for me, it was this way to find myself in the world. And, and once I got out on my own, I was able to find that there are a ton of other sapphic authors who are out there who are doing this. It was just so limited in my scope of my, my realm of reality. So definitely for me, it was that need for that representation that I wanted when I was younger. And that leads beautifully into the next question, which is why is the inclusion of sapphic characters in your genre so important? Uh, do you want to add anything to what you just said, Riley, or do you think sure. you've already it? Go ahead. Absolutely. So, you know, I think um, in romance, um, for me, I think that when we do see sapphic characters portrayed sometimes, I mean, especially in the past, representation is getting a lot better, but it was, it, there was often a lot of problematic representation, you know, either um, two women were either fetishized or somehow demonized and it wasn't really anything great. So I feel like it's, it's really great to have those authentic voices coming through in that representation um, to show, you know, that we fall in love just like everyone else does. So I think that that's, that's really important to me um, is, you know, just kind of creating those characters who are relatable where people can see themselves and including that, you know, we do have beautiful love stories and we're flawed characters and all of that. For me, I think it was just trying to fill a void in particular in science, you know, in paranormal, there are a lot of women in general. Uh, you see a lot of female lead characters in, uh, in paranormal mystery and paranormal romance, not in science fiction. And it, science fiction is my first love. I love writing paranormal as well, but science fiction is where I came to it first. And there aren't women to begin with, or at least not when I started reading it, which was a long, long time ago. But, uh, and, and then to have sapphic characters, that was pretty much impossible to find and I wanted to see those characters so kind of like you did I, I decided I'm, well, I'm going to write what I want to see because it's not there and it kind of helped me find my niche uh, in the marketplace which was which was great to finally figure out where I fit. Uh, Mari what about you? Um, so like you I do a lot of science fiction fantasy and where I would say I've gotten very interested in 
representation and thoughts about gender, about society structures, about um, restrictions, about expectations. And science fiction and fantasy seems to me to be a very good way of working with that, even though it typically does not happen precisely in this world. Um, like you, I in the ninth, um, I started reading a lot of fan, uh, fantasy and science fiction um, years back, and certainly in the 80s and the 90s, the representation for, it, it was it there? Yes. Was it easy to find? Hell no. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, and a lot of what we had was not great. And what I find now is um, when you leave that out, you are leaving out a very important, what is a very important part for me um, in terms of humanity and society. If you are not discussing queerness, if you are not discussing sapphicness, you're leaving this huge blockade and you are maybe not understanding some of society, some of gender, some of how this is all forms and is structured. So I started really doing this almost in an intellectual exercise, but also looking within my genre for other people that were doing this uh, and seeing what was going on in the genre and finding that science fiction and fantasy is a great place to explore this. Uh, I don't know as much about other genres, but science fiction, you can have uh, all kinds of permutations and you know once you've added in aliens once you've added in different uh, galaxies once you've added in uh, galaxies let's go for it <laughs> you know and let's um you know let, let's see what we can do with it yeah. mb why is this so important i'm gonna i'm gonna do a two-part answer and try not to lose the thread completely so moderate me um <laughs> Oh, yeah, because I'm really great at that. <laughs> <laughs> the first part is going to be a sort of a general smash the patriarchy answer, um, which is to say that a great deal of our popular culture totally dismisses the experience of women and the agency of women and doesn't put them in leading roles and relegates them to sort of the woman in danger or whatever. They're, they're, they exist in reference to the male characters. Um, and I like that we're now calling fiction about women who have significant relationships with women sapphic, um, because after all, Sappho was a right on woman. Um, you know, she's one of the preeminent poets of our history, uh, of all history. Um, and she, and she wrote very openly about the wonders of relationships both with men and with women. Um, so it, it's a it's a nice inclusive umbrella term. Um, but in my own writing, as a bisexual woman who is married to another woman, um, I could certainly draw from way past experience and interests in relationships with men, but that's done. It's done everywhere. Most the hundred, you know, 99% of what you see in popular culture is heteronormativity. Um, so for me, writing that something that is closer to my own experience and that validates um, lesbians, bisexual women, ace women who have significant relationships with other women, basically the importance of relationships between women um, is important to me. So getting that out there and making it visible by fronting it through the characters. Um, now, the second part of my answer is about thrillers and crime fiction. And that's just, um, it's great that if your main characters are women who love other women, badass women save themselves. I'm stealing that from Dirt Road books, but um, in, there are definitely more strong female characters in thrillers and in crime fiction in general today, which is great. Uh, they're still not getting the same level of recognition as the Jack Reachers and other kinds of, you know, sort of leading men characters. They're certainly not getting the screen time. Um, but when you make the strong female characters save each other, it changes the whole dynamic from what we're used to seeing in sort of the hero trope of somebody boldly going and saving the world and, oh no, the woman in danger is just along for the ride and doesn't have agency of her own. So it was important to me 
um, to, to flip the script, to show something different. And that's Mara, all my threads. Mara, you wanted to add something to that? Go ahead. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about the mystery and thriller genre in particular is that's the first place where I encountered a woman loving oh. woman. Uh, and in very often in very coded ways. Uh, uh, Agatha Christie is it immediately comes to mind, but George and Heyer does it as well. And I was like, ooh, this is interesting. Um, so it fascinates, so which I just wanted to add that it was a way for me to go, oh, wow, this does exist. Uh, and I found it when I was like eight or nine um, with, I was like, oh, cool. Um, not necessarily great. I don't think anyone here is gonna go, yay, let's run to Agatha Christie for <laughs> a representation because uh, definitely not, but it was there. Uh, and so there is sort of a history of having it there. And I like that we're, or you are expanding it. I, I'm really excited about that. So you all are like being great about setting me up for the next question. So, <laughs> MB, you pretty much answered this one already. How does the addition of graphic characters change your genre? Uh, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, you know, I, I actually did have a note. It said, nope, it's not changing my genre. And then I put, except to make it less misogynistic. So yeah, I would when, women, when women have agency, we get to see them making choices, being full human beings, screwing up, making, yeah, being responsible for their own lives. And okay. that's different. I would say that it changes the romance side of what I write, just because women approach romance differently. I mean, maybe not 100% differently, but there are definitely differences. You can't write a romance the same way. Uh, I'm going to let Riley really hit that one, though, because I think that that would be her, her forte there. Go ahead, Riley. Disagree, I Riley. Disagree. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I, I would love to stir the plot and disagree, but I actually, I think you're spot on there. Uh, for, when it comes to viewing it through a romance lens, um, and, and mind you, I haven't dated uh, men since I was like 18. So, I mean, most of what I know is, is relationships with women. Um, but I do know, you know, talking with um, people that are in those male-female relationships, there, there seems to be, and this isn't across the board, but especially when you look at romance, straight romance portrayed in novels, there's a lot of confusion about what someone's thinking. There's a lot of this, um, whereas two women, we tend to talk things through very thoroughly. So there's a lot more dialogue, I feel like. I also feel like stereotypically, and in all my dating experience, so maybe the stereotype is based on something, um, sapphic women tend to move a little bit quicker into those commitment areas. So I feel like that changes a little bit, um, but you still wanna, I mean, still want to create a romance that is believable. Um, I think one of the other really important things that I see that's really well depicted in a lot of the sapphic romances that I read is consent. So we're looking at things like consent, better communication, um, all of those things that if you're if you're part of a sapphic relationship, those things are all very, very prevalent um, within our relationship. So I think that that changes it um, somewhat. But the concept of falling in love is fairly universal, you know, so those the elements in the craft of that story are going to be very similar. It just may change the way that the characters interact with each other. I love what you said about consent, definitely. That is something that I try to consider in pretty much every pairing that I write in my books. Um, and I don't see it a lot in, in books that feature male-female pairings, at least not as much, not as much. Now that may be changing, uh, right. but I don't, I don't read that anymore. So <laughs> I'm not sure what's going today. But back when I was starting, you know, when I was really getting into reading romance, you didn't see a lot of consent. Uh, and I'm glad to see that that's becoming a bigger focus. Mari, how does it change your genre or does it? Uh, well, to follow up quickly on the, on the romance thing, uh, when I was reading a lot of, um, I probably shouldn't admit this publicly, but hey, I started the sentence, let's go on to it. I read a number of those Harlequin Presents um, that were <laughs> in, in the 1980s, uh, early 1990s. And wow, were they rapey. Um, not all of them, but there was a lot of, you know, there, there was a lot of that element there. And I do understand that there's less of this. Um, and when I am picking up a romance novel now, regardless of who the two main characters are, 
that has been a shift and that's been great to see. However, um, I'm not really seeing so much of the consent issues in science fiction and fantasy. It comes up. Um, but what I'm finding is that you have an expansion of character motivations. You have an expansion of who could have done this. So it, you're not looking at, um, and you also have, when we're talking about women with agency, it's different types of agency. It's not just doing this to support, um, although sometimes it is doing oh. you. It is, but sometimes it's there to support a woman partner. Um, sometimes it's there to support a, uh, a family member or something like that. And so you're having different agencies there, different approaches. And I think that tends to be very helpful. There's also, it can lead to some very fun asides. Um, I'm only at the beginning of this particular book. So um, I don't want to say too much about it because the book may suck. I'm like, when I say in the beginning, I'm like 40 pages in. And there's an aside where the two um, sister characters are like, oh, you didn't bring any woman suitors this time. How boring. And so you get that. <laughs> so having this sort of it can add to a uh, really amusing side note. So there's also the addition of some humor, um, which I'm not saying that works without this will lack humor. I'm just saying that there's different sorts of jokes and something different that you can get when you bring this in. And uh, I think this is a fantasy novel that I'm reading. We'll see how it, uh, we'll see how it goes, but Oh. I should not bring up books. I've only read 40 pages. Because <laughs> uh, you really cannot make a judgment uh, that far in. But Sure you can. <laughs> if it's really bad, you can. But so far, this is 40 pages in. I really can't judge the books. So we've talked about how it changes our genres. What difficulties does it create? I mean, the most obvious one is, you know, you've got multiple she's and everything is she did and she did and now you've got to use all the names and then the names get very repetitive because nobody calls each other by name that often in any kind of conversation in real life I find myself going through manuscripts when it, during my editing phase of you know okay how many times did I use she can you tell which she is which she how many times did I use the name can I flip it out for a she can I change it for a telling detail or a trait that that character has so you know who's speaking, um, that's all, always a big one. But the other one that I've found, not necessarily as a difficulty, but just as a difference, I guess, is that I often have to, uh, it, something that the characters are always considering is how the world around them perceives them, both individually and as a couple, which is not necessarily something that you would have to consider in the psychology of characters in a male-female pairing, because they're all, you know, most of the time they would be accepted. I see MB uh, wriggling her nose, so she may disagree with me partially. Uh, but it is, it does, even in science fiction, I find that if I don't explain somewhere that, okay, we're way in the future and it's all accepted and it's not an issue, that the reader is going to wonder if it's an issue. So I have to include it somewhere that it's prevalent and that it's not a problem. MB, I'm gonna throw it at you because you're wriggling your nose. Because <laughs> I made that weird gesture. Like, <laughs> I agree with you, I don't agree with you. Um, no, I, I generally agree with you. And my reaction was really just that all of our characters have intersectional identities. So they're all walking through the world. Um, you know, they, they may be lesbians and perceived by the world as straight, and that can raise an issue. They might be um, very butch and always getting reactions from people in a not accepting environment. Um, but also they may be people of color. They may have a disability that's visible or not visible. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that um, just for any particular story, your particular characters are going to have characteristics. So in that sense, I don't feel like it's different. I think we just, you know, each character's got their own individual intersectional identity that gives people, you know, that, that makes them have to deal with people's responses to them as they're encountering them. And that's just part of the story. And I think that's, that's true, like across genres. Yeah, I would actually say in 
in fantasy and science fiction. Um, now I'm going to bring up a very problematic, difficult name, uh, Marion Zimmer Bradley, uh, whose works I am not recommending at all uh, for a lot of reasons that we can go into elsewhere. But uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, she did have a series of books that very much explored how society was looking at a specific group of very lesbians, occasionally bisexual uh, women. So in that sense, um, and then there are a couple of other names who I'm like flying over my head right at the moment who have done this. What I find interesting in current work that I'm seeing is we've also had works that are like, oh, it's not going to make any difference at all. <laughs> and that is a and like oh you're a woman woman it, this is treated exactly the same as male male um and i'm seeing more of that in fantasy and science fiction which for me is interesting because it's not necessarily exploring what we're dealing with today where has it changed tremendously since the 1980s and 1970s absolutely where you could you know two women together on a date is not the ah! um that it used to be, but I'm not necessarily seeing as much exploration of that. And it, it seems more like what I'm seeing in much fiction is, oh yes, of course there are women are together. Uh, and that's new for me in science fiction uh, to have that reaction from other characters or maybe not new, last 10, 15 years, I would say uh, I've been seeing a lot of this in fantasy and science fiction. I, I will agree when I, when I was, trying to sell my first one, one of the things that the feedback that I was getting was that they really liked the fact that I, I didn't make a big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. They just were. And, and then they had their adventure and they did cool things, but, the, but they just, they just were. And it wasn't, it wasn't a question. It was just, it was an answer. Riley, what do you think? You know, I don't, I think that uh, all of you have, have covered it really well. I don't think that uh, for me, it changes a whole lot or creates difficulties um, because, you know, like MB said, regardless of what you're writing, you're going to have these very complex characters that, you know, maybe they have, um, I think, you know, we, we tend to look at like queer characters and say, you know, maybe they have difficulty with their family or they've lost people, but truly that's true of all people. You know, whenever we're writing any character, we have to look at what are those dynamics that have shaped the path that led them to where they are. So I don't think it's necessarily anything that's unique to writing queer characters or sapphic characters, but I think that um, one thing you touched on, Elle, uh, is the pronouns. Um, if, if both of my characters have she, her pronouns, that is something that, you know, in dialogue or in intimate scenes or in anything that can cause, you know, this really somewhat confusion. So you definitely need another set of eyes or three or four to make sure, you know, we can tell who's saying what, who's doing what, you know, where, what's going on. So I think that that's probably the main difficulty for me. You know, Sorry. I'll tag on uh, just, just real quick. I'll tag on to that. Now that we have more characters who are identifying as non-binary and they're mm -hmm. finally getting some representation, you also have to be careful distinguishing when you say they, whether you're talking about the non-binary character or whether you're talking about, you know, the two characters together doing something. So Absolutely. it's just a matter of really writing, thinking with the reader's cap on and having other readers read for you and flag places where it gets a little, you know, it's like with anything Absolutely. that you're writing, you know, did you tag your dialogue often enough so that the reader can easily follow? who's doing what, that kind of issue. Um, exactly. So it's not a huge difficulty. It's not a new difficulty. It just gets kind of expressed in new ways. Absolutely. Honestly, I think that it kind of forces writers to take their writing up, up a notch because yeah. when you have to find other ways to make your characters distinctive from one another besides name and pronoun, you you really have to describe and assign traits to and dialogue quirks to and just manners of speaking that that you might have gotten you know might have gotten lazy with at least for me um without that necessity involved so honestly i think it, it's kind of a, a cool challenge to up your writing game um so good moving on to the writing itself Tropes and stereotypes. What should writers looking to get into this avoid or embrace? What are some things that you're tired of seeing or that might be problematic? I know in sci-fi, um, 
the uh, there there have been several articles written about the, the the butch lesbian character as the martyr, and and why that is is a, a problematic stereotype. They're always sacrificing themselves. They're always dying for the greater good. Um, gosh darn it! I really want those characters I fall in love with to survive to the end of the book. So I don't play with that so much. Or if I if I do kill somebody off, they might not be permanently dead. But um, I can do that because I write paranormal and science fiction. What are some things that you have seen that uh, that you like or that you 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 would say that should be avoided? And I don't know where I started, so I'm gonna. I think I had Riley last, so I'm gonna start with Riley first. Right. Perfect. Well, going off what you said, I think that the barrier gaze trope is something that we can all agree to do our best to do away with. Um, not to say that we don't occasionally have characters that sometimes, sometimes die, it sometimes happens and it's sometimes part of the story. Um, but I think, you know, alluding to what you were talking to, I think that we've seen historically so much in, in queer content, um, that especially, I mean, if we look at the majority of, um, sapphic films, uh, that are, you know, mainstream films, it's either tragic, they don't end up together or one of them dies. Um, so I think that that's definitely a trope that, uh, I try to steer away from, you know, we, especially writing romance, we do want that happily ever after. And I think that my sapphic characters deserve that happy, happily ever after. Um, but I think also going off of something that MB said earlier, um, I think that, you know, the damsel in distress trope is something that we don't really see in a lot of sapphic um, literature today. You know, that's, that's not something our characters don't need saving. They don't need saving even from their other love interest, even if it's another woman, you know, they, they, they work together. So I think that those are two things that I really steer clear of and that, that I see a lot in the industry are steering clear of. Um, but that said, you know, I think that there are some tropes and stereotypes that in romance, especially there, there are those tropes, you know, you've got your enemies to lovers and your slow burn and your second chance and your everything like that. I mean, those are just kind of part of a romance novel. Um, I mean, not necessarily all smushed in together in one, um, but so there's no reason that, you know, sapphic fiction can't embrace some of those typical romance tropes. Um, but I think that it, you, you said something, uh, L, about stereotypes to avoid. And I think that if someone is considering writing sapphic fiction or anything, to really make sure that you're not laying into those harmful stereotypes against the sapphic community, um, there are plenty of those. And I think just making sure that if you're someone who's not in the community, making sure you have someone who reads it and make sure that it's not coming across overly stereotypical. Mari, what do you think? Uh, so I have some uh, very strong contrasting thoughts to about barrier gaze, which is probably the most famous of them. Um, I don't have a problem with it because, but I'm going to context this before we goes, oh no, <laughs> Mari's all about burying the gaze. She wants them all dead. No, I don't want that at all. Um, I think the problem has been that because the um, we haven't had all that many queer characters, having some of them die has much more meaning than it would when a heterosexual character dies. And as a result, we've kind of flipped back and gone, okay, now we can't kill off any of the gay characters. Um, I'm not saying everybody in this panel has done this or anyone in this panel has done this, but I have a problem with that approach because historically uh, in Western literature in particular, tragedy has been one of our prime genres. Uh, we're still performing Hamlet. We are still performing Oedipus Rex. We can question whether we should be. <laughs> I think that's a valid question, but these are works that have continued. These are some of the incredibly um, strong, powerful parts of our culture, uh, or Western culture. Um, and by saying, oh no, we can't kill off the gays, we are pulling queer literature out of that tragic uh, of the tragic part of Western literature. Uh, and I have tremendous concerns about that. I do understand that when Lexa was killed off at the 100, I'm sorry, that should have been a spoiler alert. This was incredibly hurtful and upsetting to people because she was the one of the few lesbian, strong, powerful lesbian characters that we had seen in science fiction TV. She was great. Um, 
So I understood why it was upsetting, but I think if we had had more characters like Lexa, we could have appreciated of, oh, this is a great tragic death. And we couldn't have that appreciation because we didn't have enough characters. So I feel like part of the way of com combating this is get more queer characters out there so that we aren't as, oh no, this is just a stereotype. <laughs> Because so that's you're saying we need more queer characters so that we can kill some of them. That's what <laughs> exactly. exactly. Get the queer characters so that you can, you know, murder them, have all kinds of fun with them because, um, and you can have some of them be mentally ill, whether which is a stereotype that I have seen not done well of the um, very. Ill les uh, mentally ill lesbian or the mentally ill lesbian that it horribly dominates her partner is one that I am not overly fond of because partly because honestly I just haven't seen that much in real life that's not the way I've seen those relationships work but we can have one or two of those if we have a whole bunch of different queer characters if we have this huge variety so my screaming here is not so much about the specific stereotypes but just get more out there <laughs> you know, in different mediums yeah. so I think that's totally the key I think that it's problematic if the only queer character in the entire story happens to be the one who also dies. Um, I'm still mad about the ending of Xena Warrior Princess, sure, sure. by the way. <laughs> Andy, what do you think? Uh, I'm, I mean, I agree with pretty much everything on the Barry Your, Your Gays uh, discussion, which is, yeah, if you only have one gay character and that's who you kill off, you have a problem from the beginning because you only had one queer character. And that's just not realistic, you know? It's like having one trans character and who doesn't know anybody else who's trans. They're the only person who shows up or one person of color or whatever. And then, you know, you've clearly thrown them in for color and they're disposable. So that's when I think it becomes, you know, if or when you're happy, when your plot res resolution revolves around getting rid of the character who you've subtly coded as problematic all the way through. Sorry, Mari, you're waiting. I just want to throw in two quick things here. One was to on the 100, Lexa was not the only queer character, which was great, but bigger um, what you just said in terms of the only trans character. The, yeah. One thing that I have seen that will happen with some stereotypes is queer, queer people tend to make friends with other queer people. Yes. I'm not saying that I don't have straight friends because I do. <laughs> But, um, but in general, a lot of my friends are queer. And so when you have that, oh, this is the token queer character, it really stands out to me because that's not necessarily the way they interact. Or yeah. Sorry. I will. No, totally agree. Reflect reality. And, mm -hmm. um, and which is what my general comments on this are. If, if you are writing own voices, if you are uh, a queer woman writing queer women of whatever flavor under the very large umbrella, um, you know, and you're, you're representing characters who are close to your own lived experience, have fun with it. Have as much fun with it as you want would be my own voices. Um, you know, don't be afraid to make jokes about U-Hauls. Don't be afraid to, to call, you know, to have your character call her Subaru a lesbaru. You know, <laughs> though, these are things that happen in real life. This reflects our culture. And if, if some readers don't get it, that's fine. You are educating some readers. Don't worry about like having to hit the middle and, and, and blur things down to make them sort of less specific and more generic and more palatable or marketable or whatever. Make your characters real characters who do make those kinds of jokes and you know, find that kind of levity amongst whatever their other daily grind is. Um, however, if you are writing the other, my advice is the same as it is for all of us who write the other, which is just to say, anytime you're writing outside of your own experience, outside of your own community, outside of your own observations based on real people and your discussions with those real people about why they do what they do and why they see the world the way they see the world, um, then absolutely, um, definitely use readers who know because 
you, you as the writer writing outside your own experience don't know what you don't know. Um, so whether you're writing uh, sapphic characters or any other kind of characters who just aren't like you and maybe aren't like the one or two people you've encountered that you know about and then you think everybody is like those one or two people, just get, just get some readers. Get some people to tell you what you missed, what your blind spots were, what's problematic, and get enough readers that um, they can disagree with each other and you can figure out like what's a general no and what's a, this is a specific to me because I'm, I have a bias that's my own kind of no. So I'm going to jump around a little bit because we are starting to run out of time and there's some that's questions good. I really do want to get to. So if you're following along, I'm, I'm jumping a little. Um, what are some difficulties you've had in trying to place the work? Um, be it trying to get an agent, trying to find a publisher, trying to find promotional opportunities. I'm kind of lumping the questions together a little bit. Uh, so, because it's, you know, there, there's, there's difficulties inherent in the writing, but there are difficulties inherent in trying to get it to the readers. Um, uh, Mari, let's start with you. Uh, so with, um, in sh short science fiction, honestly, uh, the work being queer is not a problem. The specific issue is that there is just an abundance of material out there, right? Or people writing stuff. So when I'm submitting a short fiction piece or a poem, this is a little less true of speculative poetry, but with, uh, speculative science fiction, most of those zines are accepting around 1%, sometimes a half of 1% of what they receive. And according to their editors, half of what they receive is pub publishable. So you can do the math there and see they're accepting only a very, very small amount of what's publishable. Uh, there are zines that are actively looking for queer content. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's much easier. Um, I think the larger concern right now for me is not so much with placing my work, but with the, and this is where I will get a little negative in the session, but I'm going to cheer up in a moment. Um, we are now seeing legal challenges, library challenges, um, particularly in the last six weeks uh, against queer literature. This has not impacted the short science fiction fantasy market yet, but I don't want to delude anyone by saying it won't, uh, particularly because one of the targeted presses is Ani Press, which is adjacent uh, to uh, science fiction. Fan uh, if you don't know about them, they do graphic novels, they do comic books. Um, there is an incredible amount going on with them that I'm not going to get into right now, um, but we're also seeing libraries targeted. What somewhat having had that negative note, what fascinates me is that this is happening at the same time that large publishers are going, yeah, bring us the queer. <laughs> and then we have small presses jumping up uh, going, yes, bring us queer literature, this stuff is selling. Uh, I mentioned Neon Hemlock, um, they're new. And yet they're bursting into all kinds of literary awards, all kinds of conferences, all kinds of whatever, they're doing great. So we have both this outside legal perspective that we need to be aware of, coupled with a wow, <laughs> it's going gangbusters because there's a readership out there. And I don't want anyone to delude themselves into thinking that publishers are doing this, or at least the large New York publishers are doing this out of wanting to do the right thing. They're doing it because it makes money. And yay. <laughs> so we have this, okay, yay, uh, queer content is coming. So there's some really great news out there to kind of, um, that more, I think definitely mitigates, but definitely is like something to celebrate. Cool. Um, MB. Could you repeat the question? Yes. What challenges have you encountered in trying to get your work out there, be it finding an agent, finding a publisher, finding promotional yeah, okay. opportunities? You got it. I, Mari's answer was so great that I just sort of went down that rabbit hole and forgot where we started, which is fine. I should, we should come back to that rabbit hole because it was cool. Um, for me, I did not encounter very many um, challenges because I wouldn't say I took the easy path, but I took a path that was recommended when 
as I was getting closer to finishing the first of the Maji books and thinking about where am I going to place this and how's it going to reach the world, um, other writers that I was meeting through writing groups and reader groups um, said, you know, here's a short list of publishers who would love what you are writing. And you don't have to be agented, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. And, and you know, you just pitch it to them, just do it. <laughs> and, and in fact, I hadn't even, I don't think it was really pitchable quite when I did it, but I was so excited that, that these publishers were out there and, what, and, and were publishing these works. And there was a whole world I hadn't really dipped over into before that I pitched. And they said, yes. And then I had to finish the book so I could give it to them. Um, so for me, that was a, that was a, that's kind of an anomaly, um, but it is true that within um, the queer publishing niche world, um, there are publishers that you might make, if, you know, if, if you are writing either a romance that is strictly a romance between two women, or you are writing um, sort of cross genre with women who love women as your leading characters, there's a short list of, of publishers you might want to go to if you're not doing the whole get an agent, shop to the big houses. It depends on, you know, what your goals are. Um, so that's that's just my experience and it is different than other people's. Riley. I would agree with MB there. Um, that's That was very, very close to my my journey as well. Um, I, you know, I, I looked at all the different ways that I could do things and I had worked, um, I had written some stuff before that, you know, was uh, not necessarily my best work when I was very young and two, um, it, it wasn't really authentic. It was before I was writing um, sapphic sapphic romance so um, I had tried to publish that a different way and that didn't quite work out for me so when it came time to look at my sapphic work um, I was also kind of like I, I was still in the closet and I was like there's no way this is going to go anywhere type of thing um, so I just kind of playing with fate I made a short list uh, and found two publishers that I was like okay yeah they you know sapphic literature is what they do um, and so I chose one of them and I reached out and that's how I, I, w I went the same route. Um, but I think that it, it really does, like it be said, depend on what route you want to go. There are still several um, sapphic publishers who are out there who are looking for new writers. Um, so, you know, if you kind of want to bypass that whole agent thing, you can go there. Um, I know Elle's got lots of good insight on agents. Um, so I'll set you up for that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think that depending on where you're wanting to go, um, there are options and maybe, maybe it's the me looking at it, it made it easier for me because there was a shorter list. And I know that that's, you know, a decade ago, so that's changed. And there are, there are more publishers and agents now who are accepting um, queer work. And so that, that opens the field up and probably makes it more daunting now. Um, but at that time, there were fewer. So it was easier for me to narrow down where I wanted to go. So maybe we should actually, you know, name some of the the small presses that are uh, that that focus on LGBTQ titles. Um, I know, you know, when I first started out, I didn't even realize that I only heard, had heard of ever heard of one. And, you know, I started looking for an agent because I figured an agent probably would know of more than one uh, that that might find a home for my work, in addition to having the opportunity to pitch at the big five. Uh, but when I started, th there was one that I was aware of. So, so throw some, some names out there. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of mine, which is DSP, but mine primarily does male, male. I'm with a very small imprint that does everything else in the LGBTQ plus alphabet. Um, really small imprint, like maybe four authors total and two doing sapphic stuff. Uh, what I'm with guys? Bella books. Okay. And um, my Maji books are all published through Bold Strokes Books, which considers itself a mid-sized publisher because they put out 10 to 12 uh, new releases every single month, all year long, year after year. Um, my next work coming out, the work in progress, Blur's Day's Revenge, a mid-pandemic mystery, uh, will be coming from Bywater Books, which um, is a much smaller publisher, um, really, focuses very much on um, 
let's call it strong female characters who who happen to love women. And Mari, can you tell us again the name of the publisher that you are pushing today? Neon Hemlock, uh, but along with Neon Hemlock, I would add uh, Queen of Swords Press. Uh, Aqueduct certainly does um, uh, does a number of um, sapphic works. Um, the Aqueduct I know is known more as a feminist uh, yeah. press, but they have certainly done sapphic works. Um, Small Beer um, has done a number of sapphic works. Uh, the Tachyon. Um, now, Tachyon, and uh, really, you have to have an agent to go through, but Tachyon is definitely um, printing a lot of uh, queer books. And I, I would put them more in the indie press uh, area. I think we're all wondering what will be happening with Daw, but Daw definitely, um, up until this week, I would have said, <laughs> oh, you've got an agent. I, I am now a little wondering, but they've been purchased by a, what, a, a press that looks queer friendly, so let's, uh, let's hope. Um, and then honestly, in the, you know, I know we were talking about focusing on small presses, just them, but one of the great things right now is that it seems like all of the big five publishers and really all of the major New York presses, with the exception of the obvious exception of Thomas Nelson, uh, which for those who don't know, that is a Christian press. Um, so they are not, so Thomas Nelson is not rushing to, <laughs> to, to print queer stuff, but everyone else seems to be. Uh, and, you know, just a quick look at the, the New York Times bestseller list is maybe not the best way of knowing what's possible, what is um, popular and what actually sells for a number of reasons, but it can give you some indications. And there's a lot of queer stuff appearing there from top five publishers. So um, I can also add quirk books, but yeah, if in terms of presses that are really focusing Neon Hemlock, yay, Queen of Swords, yay, uh, and you know, others, so. So I will say coming at it from the agent route, um, because when I started this thing, it was like, okay, this is how you do it. You get an agent and then the agent sends your work to a publisher. Doesn't matter the size. Doesn't matter if you could send it without one or not. You, you get an agent. That's basically what it was drilled into my head um, when I was trying to learn how to navigate this field. Uh, when I first started, you know, my, I've had four agents. My first agent was lesbian, um, even though the work I pitched her was not queer. And it wasn't until the second book I wrote that, and I, I wonder if like the, 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 somehow she knew, even though I hadn't figured it out yet that that's where my, my writing path was gonna lead me because you know, she took me on, um, not that she didn't represent non-queer writers and, or writers that weren't writing queer characters, but uh, it just kind of felt interesting that after hundreds of rejections, um, this is the agent that, that took me on Maybe just because I had strong women characters in my books, and 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 that was that was a plus there. Uh, and then I had two more agents, and then my fourth agent, my current agent, is um, is both non-binary and bisexual. And I am finding that there are more agents who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, and that opens you know not that you can't have a not queer agent, but it it's. It's for me, it certainly helped because I feel like not only does my agent get me and understand what I'm trying to convey through my words, but also really understands which editors at which publishers are going to be the most open to, to what I'm writing. And she's saying the same thing uh, that Mari is saying that, that, that there, is, there is definitely more um, demand for queer characters and is really on my case to finish the book I'm working on because they can't wait to pitch it. So uh, I, I'm excited about that and definitely about seeing the market open up. I know that when I was trying to, to sell what I do and, and what I do is very niche uh, because it's not just romance, it's sci-fi and paranormal and you know, other things. Uh, I, I had a very hard time placing it. It was, it was hard to find a publisher that wanted more than the romance and and I'm not saying that romance is an easier sell it's it's it's, it's all a hard sell it just doesn't it doesn't matter but there seems to be a larger audience for for romance than there is for romance plus and finding someone who would take a chance on that uh was was very fortuitous for me 
So we are down to the last five minutes. Uh, I want to give everybody one last opportunity to um, tell us what is coming out next or what your most recent release was so that uh, we can all go and find your books at the bookstore. Um, for me, it is Harsh Reality, which releases in August. And my most recent work prior to that is the Nearly Departed series, the first of which just won a Goldie Award. I'm so excited, which is Paranormal Romance. I am so psyched. Um, uh, Riley, what's coming next? Uh, so my latest one that just came out in May is called Take Your Shot. It is my first young adult uh, novel that's out. Uh, and then I am currently working on, it's untitled and it's going to be a while. So it doesn't really matter uh, at the time to announce it, but it's going to be a slow burn second chance. So, All right. Um, Mari, what's next for you? Uh, there is a story coming out in Reckoning Press next August uh, or from Reckoning Magazine, I should say not Reckoning Press, uh, which is about a, um, a number of water maidens, a, a local lake and things that go, uh, things that happen with that. Uh, it's very experimental. Um, I also have some upcoming other upcoming short stories and some chat books and whatever. Um, but a lot of that's not until 2023. <laughs> so the chances of anyone here uh, remembering that until the day are uh, very slim. So I would suggest just uh, follow me on Twitter or um, on my website and I'll try to keep you updated there. Same. And MB. Oh. Um, well, all of my work with badass women in love and danger, the, we are, um, the Maji Rios series, you can either look them up under me, MB Austin, or you can look them up very distinctly under Maji Rios, M-A-J-I-R-I-O-S, and you'll find them every place books are sold. Um, the steampunk too, if you find me on Amazon or anywhere else that books are sold, those will show up. Um, and currently I am working on Blur's Day's Revenge, a mid-pandemic mystery. The first question in which is murder or Darwin Award? Awesome pitch. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody. I wanna thank the conference for having us today. I wanna to thank our session hosts for keeping us on time. And uh, I think that is it for us. If our session host wants to come back. Please. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.